Hello. Hello. Okay, perfect. I can hear you now. Do you do you want me to try to um cuz there's a way to like spotlight people and stuff? Do you want me to try to do that? Uh yeah, that would be great. Okay. Fine, you sent me the instructions. It's like a little Oh. <laughs> um go to screen share arrow at the bottom. Screen share. So this time around, I'm not gonna lie, I am terrible with questions. <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to uh, to get it together. Um, but I think we should be all right. Okay. That is such a weird picture, David. <laughs> What's up, y'all? Yeah, I don't have a camera, so I have to uh, run this thing and I'm not. The it's not great it's not great i should get one but you know what we're like seconds away from returning to a space of and you think we won't have zoom then well look i'm hoping that i can become rich and famous so i can get off all social media and <laughs> zoom and the internet completely mm -mm. gonna be a ghost all right <laughs> that's fine <laughs> i mean y'all know how the internet is it's full of nonsense yeah <laughs> you know what i'm saying <laughs> okay hey allison hello okay so i did that one. Oh man um I think I'm doing this correctly. <laughs> um, all right, perfect. Um, and then select make co host. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Um, Bonnie, is that spotlighted, right? Is that like on your thing if people are in speaker view or? Yes, all I can see, it, I can, the people that I, I see, like us, you and me, Zia off to the side. Okay. And I see Bianca, David and Allison all front and center. So. Perfect. Okay, perfect. I feel like I, I should have learned more about Zoom by now, but like every time I go to do breakout rooms or anything, it's like, what is going on? <laughs> nope. They have they have updates. They they know about the organization now at this point. They they started giving their own webinars and explaining to folks like, yeah, we changed this. So here's a video about that. <laughs> so no, also like you you think two years into this, we'd all be like, oh, everything works perfectly. Yay. <laughs> no. no. No, we all learning all the time. All the time. All of the loyal time. Um, okay, but I think that's good. Cool. I'm loving this this accent wall, Allison. I know. I was just gonna say that. <laughs> I love the background. Thank you. Yeah, these are um they're Bamley K traditional hats. So um, for like juju dances or um, ceremonies, like uh, oh. they get worn on their heads, but then it's been a decorational thing right now. And, you know, I got these like a few years back and, and I didn't realize that that was a thing. Cause I don't know if anybody's watching Bel Air or anything, but um, 
in mm. uh, Will Smith's bedroom. He has three of those up front. I was like, oh my God. Oh. <laughs> I need to get into it. I heard it is really good. It is good. And um, I mean, they did a great job with casting in that. Um, and the story too, it's like, you don't know where they're going. They, they change a few things, but um, it's been entertaining to watch, honestly. It's, it's a good remake. Wow. To think that that was, it was literally, so the, the young man who, how this all even started, the young man just wanted to make a trailer of like a, serious version of of the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air yeah and so he just put it together and then Will Smith finally got on Instagram <laughs> and saw what happened and like decided to fund it it's you like, know isn't that crazy <laughs> just like a fun project that turned into an actual project so yeah yeah I do Morgan Cooper I was following him before he was um who he is now and it's so funny because i made fun of his tripod <laughs> i was like dude you gotta get a better tripod bro but he was he's uh it's you know the world of youtube is wild because um it seems like everybody just you know because he was doing videos uh that were just reviews right like when you see gear reviews or whatever mm. he was doing that and he was doing like music videos and spec work. And he actually did a really incredible um, narrative short film called uh, You Shoot Music Videos. I think that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. And it's like 20 minutes or something like that, but it's really good. Um, and then after that, he did the Fresh Prince pilot um, or fake thing, the teaser right. thing. And so I think, you know, he had enough built up to show like he's capable of doing stuff. So, you know, he was able to, he was able to get somewhere with that, but no, nah, he was definitely, he's a really talented guy. And, you know, he kind of, he does it, he does it all. Wow. Yeah. I gotta, I gotta get into it right now. I'm focused on, uh, well, Kanye's docu-series. Oh yeah. So I can get a better understanding of, of his journey um and then i saw white lotus white lotus <laughs> white lotus is crazy um and as much as i travel it made me think like i, I think i'm gonna stick to cruises i don't think i'm going to do any resorts <laughs> that was that was crazy um but it's really good that's on um hbo max um and is it Kelly's character from Insecure? She's she's in there and she's like this Reiki master um, in the that works in the spa. Um, and she she uses she uses her powers for good, but she she kind of deals with some some situations. But yeah, it's it's a weird, crazy, wacky. Um, experience of watching these different people at this resort and how they do vacations and stuff and it just continues to remind me that you can't travel with everybody yeah. and everybody is not your friend everybody is not <laughs> your friend <laughs> and you need to make sure before you go out the country with anybody you need to really make sure you know them and and what they're capable of so but uh, but yeah, White Lotus, inventing Anna. Yeah, <laughs> that was <laughs> that was crazy. And I first heard about her story because I watch a lot of American Greed, and a few years back they did a profile on her, and I'm like, I don't even understand how this young girl could figure this out in New York, but she did. And um, when I heard Shonda was making something, I was like, okay, well, let's let's get into this. Yeah, there was a <laughs> documentary out before the the uh Shonda series came out and so I had watched the documentary and then um because it's it's actually her and she was still in jail and then like they had uh she's uh she likes to draw and so it was actually quite beautiful um these different transitions would be her um drawings of of her kind of 
you know, chronicling her, her situation and explaining and stuff. And so that was really cool. Um, and they kept kind of, in a way, kind of teasing that Shonda was going to be making this, this uh, series, um, which is, it's, it's great. So, but yeah, it's amazing. But <laughs> I'm learning Netflix enjoys these stories of, of duping people. Yeah, <laughs> like I, I hate that they get such a like cinematic profile because in some way I feel like it glamorizes it a little bit. Yeah, as opposed to like you know you know maybe either listening to a podcast to just understand how crazy people are or like watching you know an actual documentary that really is objective, um, you know. But it's entertainment, I guess. It's yeah, no, they they really have a lot of different series of just people getting over on people or doing something just outlandish uh the uh the tinder swindler oh, yeah. <laughs> i'm trying to i'm trying to confirm that this okay yes okay yep yeah, okay we're almost there and then we can go ahead and open sorry okay perfect okay. I was trying to confirm that the name that didn't say uh tommy on it was tommy <laughs> oh <laughs> <laughs> um okay perfect okay i'm gonna add a tommy to a spotlight okay, yes okay and then mm, i'll add um, i'll be for a second um okay perfect i'm gonna is it okay if i go ahead and let everybody in the waiting room in okay cool Um, and just for forewarning, we are recording this. Um, we're hoping probably people will reference it afterwards too. So have a record of all your beautiful faces. Well, thank every thank you guys for all showing up today and taking time out to have this conversation that me and Bianca are very, very excited about. Um, and SPNN is excited to host. Um, we have three amazing filmmakers here with us. Um, do you want to do a round of introductions just so we know who's in this space? And Bianca, do you want to start us off? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bianca Rhodes. I am the production manager here at St. Paul Neighborhood Network. I am also a filmmaker, TV producer, and photographer. Um, my name is Ania. I also work over at SPNN. Um, I work with the New Angle Fellows and I've helped support access and programmatic stuff like that. Um, I'm a local filmmaker. I have an art collective and uh, I try to be a good community member. So. That's me. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Allison. Hi, everyone. I'm Allison Gessu, originally from Cameroon, but have been in the United States for uh, quite a while. I um, have been making films since about 2015, primarily short films, and currently working on a web series, um, but also on the board uh, of the Minnesota Women, Women in Film and Television as president, and uh, Bianca, you didn't say, but a uh, board member of Film North, uh, <laughs> President Bianca Rose right there, and i um, just happy to be a part of the panel. Thank you for inviting me. Tommy. Hey, thanks for having me. Shout out to Bianca, Bonnie, Samia, um, and uh, my fellow panelists here. Uh, my name is Tommy Franklin, um, a media maker, primarily film here in, uh, in the Twin Cities. Uh, grew up here, um, excited uh, to be, you know, working on new projects, slow projects, mo projects, and, uh, Excited for this chat today. David. Hey, y'all. I'm David Buchanan, a writer director for Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, I've done several short films. I have a feature film that's got distributed back in 2020. Uh, you can find it on Amazon, iTunes, or Vimeo. It's called Black in Minneapolis. Um, and I'm just 
continuing to work on stuff right now. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Um, before we get started and delve into all the questions and stuff that Bianca has prepared in our conversation, um, I wanted to shout out our funders. Um, this event was made possible by the voters of Minnesota through a grant um, through the State Arts Board, thanks to, thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and an award from the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, I'd also like to take space to acknowledge that we are on uh, Dakota land. And I also want to hold for a moment just to acknowledge the impact and the way that white supremacy and capitalism are kind of chipping away at all the things that make us human with all the violence and stuff happening in the world, all the stuff that we talk about and that's publicized, all the stuff that isn't. Um, so I want to hold space for that too. Um, and in Minnesota, we are very close to Padote land um, and all the, the, the genocide that happened here um, and just making space for the fact that a lot of a lot of our intentions and our work is to share those stories and amplify voices that are often left out. Um, so yeah, uh, Bianca, would you like to start us off? All right, so uh, honestly, with Black History Month and, and all that's going on, um, sadly, we always have to start with the, the, the negative stuff, right? The things that we're, we're dealing with. Um, and I'm gonna be a little different today because <laughs> I am trying to foster as much Black joy as possible um, as we close out this, this month. Um, and so I guess my first question, um, instead of talking about uh, uh, in the beginning, the barriers, the different types of issues that we face in our filmmaking, what has been some of your successes over the last couple of years? Um, we actually, uh, Facebook reminded me that we did a panel discussion uh, two years ago, um, right before the pandemic. Um, talking about uh, Black filmmakers, the, the future of Black film in Minnesota. And so it was like literally this last weekend. So, um, so yeah, that's my first question is what are, what, have, what are some of your, your successes? Like what are some of the things that you are most proud of has happened um, since all this has happened? Who wants to go first? I know it's kind of a, big question. I, I can go first. Um, so yeah, like you kind of mentioned before the pandemic hit, it seemed like, you know, things were on the up and up. Um, right around that time, I had just finished my uh, third short film, which is Happily Married After. And towards the end of uh, production, basically when post-production, um, I was, I think, lucky enough to uh, get the Jerome Foundation grant uh, for uh, filmmakers. So that really helped me through my post-production uh, process. Uh, again, very aspirational at the time. I was like, okay, this is a, a great way to kind of head into 2020 with, um, you know, great content. Because it, it was different from my first, which were a little bit more dramatic. It was more comedy based. And, you know, just looking for that levity to be able to connect with other filmmakers, you know, th things were looking good. But we know the pandemic hit. Um, but re regardless of all the things that have happened um, over the last couple of years, I think in, in essence, even though things have slowed down, we've been able to, I think, collectively just um, assess the environment, be supportive of each other, especially as, you know, Black people and Black filmmakers, we've been, we've been kind of been there collectively for each other. Um, and then, again, the projects have continued, even, even if they're slow. Um, like I mentioned, I, I was able to, um, late last year, work on a web series just to get my, my feet wet to figure out what does it feel like getting, getting back into the swing of things with the pandemic um, still, still underway. I was again being very cautious because I, I have lost people from COVID, and so just knowing that, trying to be very cognizant of just the health rules, health regulations being really strict about you know vaccinations, masking up, and things like that. And um, from that, again, I'm, I'm happy that I'm still able to create. Um, like fortunate enough to still have a full time job, so um, I think that has been the good side of things, I guess. Uh, yeah. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of stuff came out, just had me thinking about that. Allison was talking about, it reminded me of like how important uh, patience has been. Can y'all hear me okay? Mm -hmm. 
um, you know, two and a half years or whatever, however long this pandemic really started. Um, you know, there have been like some opportunities, grants, fellowships that have stitched things together. And like, honestly, before, right before the pandemic, people that kicked off like backing me in a real way, the first people to ever do it was SPNN, um, I wanna say in 2019. And then just along the way, like stitching together some of these opportunities that I've been fortunate to get to like keep me from like going on taking up a shift somewhere where I don't want to ever work again or whatever. Um, but more important than those opportunities uh, in, where in some cases it financially created bridges for me to keep making the things I'm most passionate about, which is film. Uh, more important than that was like the, the, the relationships with people in the cohorts from SPNN all the way to like my other most active cohort, which is a group from um, from a Sundance thing, and then in between from Cartanquin in Chicago, like the people in these cohorts, I wouldn't have bet money that we'd all stay in touch in some way in the pandemic, but miraculously we have some small ways, medium, large, and that's that's been a blessing. Um, and, and, and so just like that appreciation mixed with like whatever, <laughs> I'm not gonna say daily ambitions to keep making stuff, but when it does, when you know, when the fires are really burning, um, leading into community that's not just in the creative community, but also just in the overall Black community um, from from Minneapolis to beyond, uh, people I've built relationships with that I've been able to really be grateful for their their time, conversations, uh, grateful for people in my community. Uh, not running away from their blackness in a non-performative way. Um, white allies who don't run away from being complicit. Um, so, you know, this, this has been so much to think about and reflect on that we'll have like probably a couple more decades to reflect on just from this two years. So it's been interesting. David? Yeah, I, I, uh, um, I mean, my success is I, I got, I won the McKnight, um in i don't remember 2020 i believe actually it won the mcknight and then i got my film distributed uh it got picked up so it got re-released it was called black and then it became black in minneapolis because it got distributed uh by visit films and so uh that was some success there and then i've just been constantly uh sort of working um out of actually out of the trauma of george floyd getting murdered i started working more because i think uh productions realized they wanted more black people around or on set um so that sort of happened i don't i'm trying to think if there's anything else i mean it's been things have been very kind of uh low key um and we're just now starting to not it's starting to not be that way which is great so i know there's a you know a few movies shooting here in march which is good so um yeah i'd love to sort of i mean i've been working but i'd love to sort of get back out there uh more so than i've been because a lot of it's been um kind of inside doing stuff uh but yeah i don't know i mean the I'm having some more successes right now. Uh, I got a screenplay and a few competitions that's going. It's getting, you know, a quarter finalist. And so we'll see where that goes. Um, and then besides that, uh, just locking in certain deals and things like that. That's it. Cool. I actually want to talk about um, some of people's experiences um, as a media maker during that the time of uh, the murder of, of George Floyd and the uprisings was there any times that I almost feel like ex exploiting um, media makers or, or trying to uh, how do I explain it where there was intention around all of that to get specific people but kind of like misusing I had heard that some people have had some some interesting situations that kind of happen with um, bigger media outlets trying to reach um, different uh, black media makers and, and stuff and 
some of some of it was ex exploitation. Um, did anything like that kind of happen um, to you over over all of that craziness? Because there was a lot of people that were scrambling to find people to to do stuff, um, and a lot of times I think for no money or um, no compensation or you know a credit. Um, things like that. So, can you want to speak towards that or any experiences that they had? Yeah. Um, so, you're, you're talking about like after George Floyd, people kind of coming in. And yeah, I think, you know, it's funny because uh, I was lucky enough to get on a production um, that had local people on it. Uh, the director is DA Bullock, and uh, we had local producers, Nora and um, Sarah, I don't think is local, but anyways, uh, the DA is great. And so he, he got us on a project to, to do the documentary for um, the voting uh, that had just happened, right? Right. So for public safety, which, you know, they, they didn't vote, go that way. So, you know, ended up, you know, whatever. And we kind of can see what happened after that, because, of course, three other black men got uh, killed um but that's a good thing that happened in terms of da being able to kind of uh you know hit me up wanted me to be dp on that and then i was able to hire on some other other black folks but uh other productions yes had did come here and i remember working for one and um it was interesting because you can kind of see the way they were going about it and it was so i don't know any other way to say fake um, but it was just like they were documenting sort of like uh, around George Floyd Square and having people talk about sort of like these traumatic things that have happened, but in a very like Hollywood way mm -hmm. <laughs> and sort of to sell like this pilot. And it's it's corny, you know, and it was a it's a check. So it's like, I, I don't know it. It's it, I think there's going to be some of that. And then you kind of have to ask yourself if you want to be uh I don't know if you don't want to do it or if you want to do it because you got to, you know, you got to pay bills or whatever like that. But that was kind of my experience with outsiders coming in. Um, in my experience, I definitely got a lot more calls in terms of just, you know, folks trying to introduce themselves and, you know, figure out who's out there, which um, I mean, I think in essence was nice, but, you know, whenever things tend to feel so opportune, I am a little bit more cautious about how I approach those. Um, and then also trying to make sure that, um, again, just knowing how intense the last couple of years were um, or and have been, uh, that I protect my mental space. So um, in terms of, you know, folks coming in and, and I think what, what they were trying to get at was all that trauma porn that people are trying to bank in on, um, definitely try to make sure that, in, you know, preserving my psyche. I, I stayed around what I was comfortable in, in, in terms of, you know, you know, my bubble. And um, I think more than anything, just wanted to really focus more on those, you know, Black creatives who were genuinely putting out the news or putting out information um, the way that it needs to be put, rather than trying to do it because it's the hot thing at the moment. And then in, in my aspect, really just focusing on on my work and, and really trying to navigate more towards, um, you know, lighter, lighter content. Yeah. Uh, what I've experienced, uh, you know, I definitely, personally, I removed myself from ever picking up the camera, having anything to do with uh, the cops killing George Floyd and other recent Black folks they killed. I'll probably never pick up a camera. And regarding that, um, in a nonfiction sense, um, you know, if I ever write fiction stories one day that you know that reflects some of my lived experiences and it involves some of that, perhaps, but I'm, it's not at the front of my mind because uh, you know, just people are really hurting and really in a lot of pain, and it's going to take like probably like at least a thousand more years to really heal. <laughs> That's black people, and I'm not even like. No, that's <laughs> already on a thousand year part. Um, uh, I mean, as far as work goes, I didn't, I didn't get much work. We can talk about that. Like as a black media maker in this town, maybe we can talk about that a little later. 
I, I got lowballed on some stuff. And, um, you know, I'm still learning. I'm always learning. But one day, if I ever decide to, like, you know, I used to coach basketball. One day, I'm going to teach youth how to, like, who are interested in media making. Um, you know, that's going to happen. And I, I want to be able to tell them, ask for your worth. And if I was saying yes to these lowball deals, which I needed because I needed to pay the rent, I really needed that money. But I can't take that money and then go tell the youth, ask for your worth. So mm. you got to just sometimes you just got to make those hard decisions. Uh, so that's happened in this pandemic of all things. And um, definitely there were a lot of like out of town white media maker vultures who like really capitalized financially. Um, there's no need to ever name names because that's kind of the norm. It's like the gentrification of all things, including, you know, including art, right? Um, but yeah, it, it's been interesting to have really good conversations uh, with fellow filmmakers, especially in nonfiction around if you happen to be working in something before the pandemic, before the uprising stuff, um, how does that affect what you're current, you know, what you're in the middle of making? And um, the best conversations I feel came around to um, filmmakers like, you know, bouncing thoughts and ideas back and forth. And most of us landed on essentially, like I had, you know, I had a friend making uh, a documentary um, called Homeroom that like did really well at Sundance last year about Oakland kids trying to get uh, SROs out of their school. Mm. Then, the, then, the, then the George Floyd thing happened and they had the filmmakers had to be like, well, we're not gonna really add that element to this film by the end of the day, the students launched their own protests out there in Oakland from these high schools. And that's the subjects they were following the film. So it was in there, but the students made the decision to just, that, that's how they were gonna live their lives. And part of it involved that. So they did film it, but it all came down to what still like organically what was happening with the subjects. And even with the pandemic, right? Cause like my, one of my documentaries and another, friend, two other uh, filmmaker friends, their documentaries involve people who are currently incarcerated. And then you had like the pandemic ravaging people in, in jails and prisons. And it's like, okay, do we put this in there? Do we put that having to do with COVID and everything? And at the end of the day, it's like, what is happening to the subject regarding the pandemic and COVID? That can go in, but we're not gonna like rewrite the treatment, you know? And so what the best decisions we all would come to would be, Sorry about that. Would would be a consensus, and we would all kind of arrive at the same place of like keep it organic, and so that's been a good lesson to learn, which I think can easily go beyond uh, this time when it comes to, um, especially nonfiction filmmaking. So I kind of have a, a follow up after that because I know I struggle with, with with my work. There's a whole project that I had to like just piece out because of COVID. Um, where, how, how did you adjust in your productions? So like a lot of my work right now has to do with two very vulnerable groups. So young people and elders. And so I would get all excited, you know, because my brain is two years ago, <laughs> right? Like we're going to have all these people in the interviews and we're going to have a studio and da, 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 and you get everything. And then you get that email, like, wait a minute, hold on. I, my partner is immunocompromised. Uh, is there a Zoom option? <laughs> or how can we do this? And um, scheduling and logistics and stuff. How did y'all navigate through that and still make something that you're proud of because like you know zoom only has so much and then you know your subjects you're now it's not just the the interview and breaking stuff down but now it's like okay can you tilt your camera can you <laughs> you know what i'm saying you're asking you're directing them a little bit more than maybe what they might be used to and so how how have y'all dealt with that in regards to production and, and still making quality work. Who 
who wants to go first? Uh, it's so <laughs> hard. It's so hard. Like, I mean, for my documentary, we were supposed to shoot in five states and go into prisons. Well, that ain't happening. Um, the travel restrictions. And when I say restrictions, I mean me and my team's restrictions based on respecting science at all times means we're not going to be out here while and out traveling a bunch when we don't need to. Because we don't have to make it yesterday. And it, it does suck for elderly people who, there, I know people who've had elderly subjects in their documentaries and it's very tricky. But um, me with the prisons and the travel in the multiple locations, state, state to state, we just sat back. Um, my, my main DP for the film, for this particular documentary is in Chicago, right? So that poses a challenge. And uh, it wasn't until quite recently where I got a mentor um, who, who's produced documentaries, who's just challenging me to think outside the box even more, right? Like I don't, I write, I produce, I direct, I do not shoot. I don't, I, like don't, don't have me pushing any buttons. Mm -mm. Don't have me trying to focus, like, and uh, <laughs> I had to like start shooting myself a little bit. Now, not like crazy, like, oh yeah, I'm, t I'm the DP. No, 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 no. But I had to think outside the box that maybe, you know, maybe I'm gonna need a fresh demo if I'm gonna get a new producer and go after more money for the budget. So I had to think outside the box and that wasn't necessarily hard to do creatively, but I was stuck in this like, you know, feeling a little bit of shame for not having produced more in the pandemic, you know, and, 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 and felt like pressure. And then the good news is when you have a good peer group and maybe uh, certain organizations who support you telling, you know, you know, we support you as an artist versus we support you as a grantee. There's a difference, you know, and we don't talk uh, about that. <laughs> And so that's that's been uh, it's been a challenge, and literally it wasn't until like this year where I felt less stuck. And there's still a lot. There's still there's still challenges, but over you know overcoming those challenges while not feeling stuck. And and, and when I say stuck, like ninety percent of that stuff is in your head as a creator, right? You just in your head like feeling like oh, all kinds of ways. So yeah, it's it's just like when someone tells you the cliche of think outside the box. When you're stuck, it sounds like just a cliche, but when you get, as you get unstuck, you realize, oh yeah, this is what I love to do and I'm capable, so let's get to it. Even if you're only spending an hour, an hour a day, three hours a week, get climbing out of that, that, that box, um, it's gonna work out. Thank you for I guess I could go next. Um, so I focus primarily on narrative and fictional content. So before the pandemic, I had this goal to work towards my first feature. And that was something that I actually also got a, a small grant from the Minnesota Arts Board for um, basically mid pandemic. Um, but then just knowing that the, the scale and, and um, intention behind doing a feature film does require the bodies, does require the people. I have basically been in that think outside the box window, whereas like I need to figure out how to call down the script so that it has minimal people, minimal bodies and, and figure out how to, you know, get something and, and still reach the same intention that I had. I am changing a little bit of the story behind it too, because it, you know, pre-pandemic, it was a pandemic type story. And I think people are kind of tired of that <laughs> two years in. So I basically have to look at that from like a complete different direction now. So there's been just a lot of rethinking and that's been very, very challenging to do. But um, uh, like, uh, like I said, last year I did um, work on a web series just to get my, my feet wet in terms of what can I feasibly do um, with somewhat longer form content, but keeping it safe. So. I had, I think like a 40 page web series, which is gonna end up being hopefully eight episodes, five minutes each. So most of those episodes are like between three to five minutes or basically three to five pages. And um, the, the crew was extremely small. It was me, the DP, who's the um, director of photography, um, the sound guy, and then my AD who was also scripty. So that was basically the four of us. And then it was a four day shoot, which was intense for like 40 pages um, worth of content. 
and made sure that most of our scenes was, you know, two people and locations to a very minimal. So we really did keep it window blocked and structured so that, um, again, just for health concerns and trying to be safe, we were aware of, you know, what was happening for all those four days. So there was a lot of pre-planning uh, going into production. And then also um, making sure that every, again, like I said, I, everyone was masked at all times, unless you were having talking lines and in, in, in front of the camera. But again, everyone was masked at all times. Um, the one thing that I did last year that was kind of, or is it two years ago? I don't know, it was last year. That was kind of close to documentary was um, doing uh, David's highlight on uh, the McKnight Fellow. Luckily, he's uh, he's great with camera. So he set up the camera. All I have to do is interview him and then edit it. But um, that has been, I, I feel for documentary folks, because again, it's like, it, you can't, not that you can't plan, but then it, it, it's a, it has to be a little bit more organic than how we do for narrative and, and, and scripted stuff. So um, yeah, it'd be great to just get even David's perspective on that, because I know he's done a lot of documentary too. Yeah, it's um, it's funny, uh, Bianca. You're probably gonna hate my answer because uh, <laughs> I don't like, hate any of your answers, bro. You well, it, about? it's <laughs> like I just was like, forget this. Like, <laughs> this ain't even worth it. Because it's just <clears throat> here's one thing I will say. It's like, um, you know, as a director and somebody who's if it's your project, you're you're the captain and the you're the whatever you're the basically the motor and everything right you're the person who's going to be doing it all even if you have a producer and you have a partner or whatever it's like at the end of the day it's in your head it's what you're going to sleep with every night and sometimes it's just way too much and sometimes you know it's like is it even worth the the struggle or whatever so um i will say that i have given up on something um because i was just like it's saying worth it for me so that's not a great answer <laughs> um but i did i did that um with that being said um i wouldn't recommend that and also uh there's been other projects that i've done so it depends on how much passion you have for because if you have passion and you really really want to get it done then you know if there's a will there's a way so um in terms of the docs that I've worked on, because I don't have any specific docs that I've done, I'm doing one right now. And it's just, I mean, it's easy for me to just say, hey, do you want to get interviewed? And then people can say yes or no. And then I show up and I'm either, you know, I'm wearing a mask and they tell me I could take it off or not. And then that's just what happens. And I interview them and I can do everything myself. So I have the background to light it, shoot it, do the sound and all that. Um, so that's, that's just one benefit. But you know, in terms of just other things, even narrative work is very difficult to do. So it's like, you know, we, I banged out a scene. Um, actually, Allison was producing that. And, we, you know, we had, you know, act, there was only one actor in the room and that was fine or whatever. But it's like, at the end of the day, it's just, it's just too, it was too difficult. So I think um, the, the best answer I can give to this and not, you know, do as I say, not as I do is, um, you know, nobody's going to do it for you. You know what I'm saying? How much do you want to, how much do you want to um, get this thing done and made? And how much do you want to see it on the screen? Is anybody else going to do it? Do you really love it that much? Are you going to, is your life going to be worse without doing it? And then just do it, you know? Um, Cause there's people out there willing to help and, and give it what they got to give. And, you know, you just make sure everybody's safe and, and do the thing. And like, it's, it can be a struggle, but I'm going to tell you right now, it's like, pre-pandemic i mean forget the pandemic for a second do you know how hard it was making black like black in minneapolis that was hard <laughs> i mean there wasn't a day that i didn't wake up and think like i could just end this whole thing right mother now you know what i'm saying <laughs> but you know, know that feeling. we all know that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you gotta you know just what? push through it yeah exactly exactly but you know you push through it and you get it made away. and and then it's done you know man and I guess as a follow-up to kind of some of the things that I've heard y'all talk about, I'm interested in what are what are the pieces about filmmaking or storytelling that kind of keep you coming back? Because it's not an easy craft. And I think it doesn't get the same validation that other art practices get. Um, and so I'm curious, just like individually, what are some of the things that like 
pull you back to it and make it so like, no, this is, this is what I've decided to do with my life and my time. And it's valuable in this way to me. Like, and, and even if you have like a ritual around it and like how you just kind of bring yourself back to like this, I'm, it's, it's kind of like, I'm doing a good job. I'm doing a good job. Like your own little, you know, whatever. <laughs> I like torture. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so, like David said, when you're in the middle of it, every single day that you wake up is like, oh, I don't know why I go through this. Um, but I, I think when I look at you know my myself as a person and, and, and my personality, I'm one of those people that does like to have an impact of some sort. And even if it's not from storytelling, because I, I, like, I'm still working on becoming the best storyteller that I can be. I know that I have a ton of work to do towards that, but letting people know that as a black woman, as an African, you do have this ability, you can do it, you know, you can figure it out. I think that's still impactful in a way. So maybe, maybe that's my why. <laughs> well, Making it, why I love films is kind of, it's a little, there's a little bit of a difference, but it's always been the most cathartic thing for me. Like my biggest drug is just watching films. So at some point I figured it was gonna make me want to, the thing I'm obsessed with, I might as well give that a stab versus, you know, something else. Something else I'm not remotely capable of being good at. Like I'm, I'm interested in space. I don't have a chance at getting the space, okay? Um, in terms of being an engineer or an astronaut. So it's like, okay, this is the thing I'm most interested in. You know, I got a job at like, back when DVDs existed, I got a job at the Hollywood Video so I could basically steal a lot of DVDs and never bring them back to the store. So and then just like, that was like high school, it was just like going crazy watching films um, and then, I love to write. Oh my God. Like, um, and I was actually, I was in prison for like three years and I already loved film. And then I would like try to have like stimulating conversations and that wasn't always an option. And then I was like writing kites to the prison therapist. Like, I just need to talk to someone. I don't think anything's wrong with me, but I just need to have conversations. And they write back, we're like, well, there's nothing wrong with you, Mr. Franklin. So you can't see a therapist. I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ. So then uh, that's what got me to like create fictional conversations between two people. And that's when I started writing scripts. So, you know, say, okay, we're gonna try to keep this thing going. And so yeah, it's just like, uh, also just watching a really good film. I, I, I prefer character, deep, dark, deep, sometimes dark character dramas over anything. So I can actually exercise a lot, a lot of emotions by like being empathetic with like, really well-written characters, really well-acted out scenes between actors. That's when I, I I watch a movie and I'm like bawling all the time. And like in real life, I'm like, hey, why don't you just have a good cry, sir? And sometimes I can't. So I just like watch a really good dramatic film and have that good cry through a movie. So yeah, I don't know. I just feel like until I wake up every day and don't think about it in some way, whether it's making a film or just thinking about a film I want to see or that I just saw, then I'm just going to try to stick with the struggle here. Um, it can be beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> a beautiful struggle for real. Yeah. I th you know, I, it's funny because I've, I've been doing, I've been doing film for a while. So it's kind of like, sometimes I have to remind myself of why I do this, but I think the biggest, the biggest reason why I create is because I think, think I make stuff that uh nobody else is gonna make so I want to see what uh I want to see it so I create it and I'm like oh this would be interesting and I really like this idea um that's one of the the biggest reasons um there's a lot of there's just a lot of little stuff that's like um I've just always been sort of an artist so I drew, I drew like comics and stuff as a kid. I saw, so how I started reading was I was reading comics because um, schools weren't very good to me. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, you know, it's, it's, and then I guess my inspiration comes from like movies that I love, but then even uh, just a few days ago, I can't, maybe it was last week or something, but 
E.G. Bailey and Shea Cage put on a, a show um, on Grand Avenue and they, they showed their works that they were past working on. And that was really inspiring because it was like some really cool stuff. And it's like, look, see, this is what we can create here yeah. um, locally. So I was just like that. That makes me want to go home and, and, and put some work in, uh, which I did. So it's like, you know, it's there's a lot there's a lot of and I think, you know, one of the biggest reasons why people create just in general, I think, is they love it. You know, you can't really stop doing it even if you you know tend to wean somewhere else or go somewhere else you always end up coming back to the the creating space because that's just something that you tend to love and enjoy oh man shout, shout out to to eg um it was actually also very inspiring to me um to i guess go back and remember you know, like, oh, I sent I sent that makeup artist over there. Oh, this person is doing this now. I'm so proud of them. Or um, I didn't even get a chance to see this. I was at the table reading years ago and now. <laughs> so um, so shout out, shout out to them and, and Black Star, um, which I believe is is an amazing opportunity for um, Black filmmakers and, and Black media makers to plug into um, opportunities. Um, and, and that's kind of how they're framing that particular piece, uh, Black Star. So y'all can Google it, find it, learn about it. Um, I have a, so, I have a oh, go ahead. Go ahead, yeah, go ahead. So speaking of EG and Shay, like I know for a lot of people, at least in my peer group, they're kind of like mentors in a sense around just like making art and kind of being consistent in the way that they have been in the Twin Cities for so long. Um, and I know Tommy had mentioned mentorship. And I think also filmmaking is, is, an, is one of those crafts where people don't treat it as like if you have an, like an apprenticeship or like this kind of like thing that you get to work underneath or like kind of work with and grow in that way. Um, so I'm interested for other for people, how has it been finding mentorship or finding people that like aid in your development in that way that you can, that, that you feel kind of expand how you think about your craft and like the, the tools that you use and stories that you tell. Cause it, it often can kind of feel very like isolated and like you're kind of figuring out things on your own but it's like other people have done this stuff and there are other people in the community that have done the work. So has anybody had success? And also Tommy speak to like, if you want to, the process of finding a mentor. I mean, I was just blessed. Uh, well, I guess I can go back to uh, the Cartempin uh, Diverse Voices and Docs. They hook you up with a mentor. And this is like zero shade to Cartempin, but sometimes like mentors in, in all aspects of life don't, don't align, right? And they hook me up with, with, with someone and that that person was just like non-existent, never returned a phone call or email, just, you know, just had a crazy ego, which, you know, I'm never gonna make names, but like, it just, they're not, they're not guaranteed to work out, which is fine. If you understand that, you move on. Right. Um, and, but the most recent mentorship I have, uh, so her name is Lauren Domino, and she produced Time, if y'all saw that documentary last year, uh, got nominated for an Oscar and all that. She's a Black woman who's from New Orleans, and um, basically Sundance created, Sundance created a BIPOC mentorship program that started this year. And so they, they reached out to me and her and said, we, we think you two would be great in this new mentorship program that, we're, that we started. So that's like a new thing for me where it is going well because uh, <laughs> she keeps it real and that's all I ask, you know, like, and we're, we're like, yeah, like, let's not even have, let's not even meet if we're not doing that constantly, you know, keeping it real, challenging, uh, challenging one another to think about certain things having to do with uh, the process of getting these documentaries made. So, uh, uh, you know, in the last couple of years, the second one is, is going all right. And I'm just grateful because it was kind of presented to me. Um, but searching for them, I wouldn't recommend. Because again, you don't know what you're going to get. Um, so whether it's people you trust trying to, you know, connect you with people or a relationship you've already built that evolves into some type of mentorship, I'd say those two options are better than like seeking one out. 
mentorship? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree what Tommy just said, because um, it, it is really more about relationships, if anything, on my end. So if there's folks that I've worked with that I've enjoyed and, you know, we kind of have a good rapport between, you know, both of us. Um, and, and another thing that he kind of said is it's it's symbiotic, right? It's not just a one way relationship. You don't just look to learn from, but also see how you can also teach. Um, you know, granted, those levels will be different. Um, I think again, it's it's super important to just find those type of people that you really do connect with, and it's not just you know reaching out blindly to be like, hey, I, I saw you did this, and and sometimes that's fine, and that that could work. But I have found, at least in my experience, what has worked is having at least an initial relationship to back that off of. And then also, you know, figuring out ways that you can also help them in ways. Yeah, uh, I would say, um, you know, that's a, it's, it's a, um, I think finding mentors is, I think reaching out and just, um, if you like somebody's work or just want to get advice from them, that's the best way to do it and be humble about it. Um, I, to be honest, for me, it's like, I haven't really had, at least if they were bad mentors, I kind of moved away from them quick enough that I didn't even recognize them to be mentors. Cause I feel like all the ones that were in my life were actually very beneficial. Um, you know, just from, uh, Ed Leschke helping me, uh, write, right. So I, I was, I, I am in the screenwriters workshop group and just been doing that since uh, 15 14 something like that um and then dave palm teaching me lighting uh so it's just been i mean if you really want to know a quick way to uh get ahead and learn something i think it is getting a mentor you know and if you're just really humble about learning and and doing that then it, you're going to learn so much and, and do so much and yeah you know a lot of good things can come out of that um so i think you know, it's, it's important. I'm, and I think, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's interesting because I, I hear some people say that they don't have any, or it's hard for them to get a mentor. And I, and I wonder kind of what they done to try. Um, because it was, it was easy for me to just say, I want to learn about this thing, you know? Um, cause I, I genuinely did. I genuinely wanted to learn how to write. Now I think I'm really good you know, not to pat myself on the back, but you know, it is what it is. Um, and it's the same thing with lighting. It's like, you know, I'm, I can write out the schematics for how I want it to shoot and show up and then and, and do the thing. So, yeah. So I want to talk about um, experiences with art organizations, um, fellowships, uh, applying for stuff, all, all the stuff that, that comes with that. And there's a lot of different barriers and, and such that kind of happen in that process. Um, but um, what do you believe art organizations or, or grant offerings like to need to know about media as an art form? Because I still feel like there are still organizations that just don't really see media as art, um, but they know they want to tap into those that group, that artist, they want to reach us, they want to reach BIPOC communities that, that have filmmakers and all this kind of stuff, but where, where are they just not knowing what they're doing? <laughs> I know it's kind of a loaded question, but where do you think they're uh, missing their mark as far as understanding it? Uh -oh. <laughs> I just stumped everybody. <laughs> I, I want to add. I want to add because yes, me, me, me and Bianca were talking about this, and as somebody who does other art, other mediums and stuff, there are tons of conversations going around about how to make grants and things more accessible to folks and kind of like the process being less laborious and more centered around the art versus like having specific language and like all these different things that people are required to and I have never have I ever applied I don't think I've only applied for one film grant and it was extensive like it was one of the most extensive things I've ever done in my life and so it was like this is not accessible and does and does even that type of language or process 
speak to the, the type of work that they're wanting to happen through giving the money. It's like they say one thing and then the, the grant reflects or the, the, the process reflects something totally different. Um, and I know a lot of people in the film community have been talking about how those are kind of been like inequitable and it's inaccessible to folks who want to create the work and are creating the work and have to go through this huge thing. It's like a feat to do a grant. It's, you have to stop doing everything that you're doing. But yeah, those are some, those are some of the things me and Bianca were talking about. Yeah, I, I'll say it's just straight off. It's like it, the grants are trash, like in terms of not the money, but in terms of filling them out, it's like, and maybe because I'm just not, right, I can write creatively, but I can't write academically in the ways that they want me to talk. And so, and I just don't do that, you know what I mean? Like, um, yeah, I just don't do that. So it's like, I, even when I filled out the McKnight, I got help. Um, I got mad help. I got a lot of help. So, and and I think that was one of the reasons why I got it, you know, besides like the work samples, it was like, they really want to read that artistic statement or artist statement and be like, yo, this is, this is good. Um, but some of these other ones are just, I know that Jerome has gotten way more ridiculous and like, I, maybe it was that way before, but it's just like a lot of, just a lot of trash in there i feel like you know and i hate to diss it so hard i don't know if they're on this call or not but it's just like they're asking questions that don't need to be asked and then the you know i i don't know i mean maybe allison has a better comment about it but i'm gonna talk shit about all these ones i don't like so the minnesota state art board i mean that one just is crazy it's like they got like a billion things in there that don't make any sense and it's like look man I'm trying to make it simple. Like, I think the McKnight is the best. Like I needed help on the artistic statement. And as far as the other stuff, even Eric Mueller said, listen, that other stuff doesn't matter as much as your work samples and the artistic statement. Everything else is like extra. And so that's great. Cause that means I gotta do one thing, right? On this other stuff, it's, I mean, I'm not gonna pull up the website and read it to y'all, but it's, it's, it's ridiculous. And some of the, some of the stuff can make sense if it's um if it's necessary in a way of like you know we want to make sure that this is going to the right person and that um and that you're just not going to be frivolous with the money or whatever right like put some of that in there if it if it's necessary but that can also be in your resume so you might not even need to ask that question if your resume says this is what you've done before because they're going to look at that anyway um and I personally, if I'm not getting Can help I, with the grant, I, you know. I just, I can't even do it. You know what I'm saying? I can't even, I can't even write out the grant because it's just too, it's too much and it's going to take too much time. And I got time that's needed for other things. Yeah, grant writing is definitely a tedious process. It's one that, you know, I think I applied to uh, Jerome at least three times before I got it, um, applied to McKnight a couple times, have not got it. Um, Arts board, same thing, applied a few times and then you know finally got it. Uh, and I've also sat in a couple of those panels because um, it, just in trying to understand you know, why the process is the way it is, I, I'm happy to have at least had two occasions where I could sit behind the curtain and see, okay, and, and I agree, it, it is a lot of information, but I think in essence, basically what they're driving at and, and really um, even just reviewing some of the grant applications, you kind of, you look at work samples and you look at the artist statement and, and that is really it because they want to make sure that if anything, you do have that vision and you do have that consistency. And then um, knowing to like, you know, what the output of the grant is going to be, because this is stuff that even though you are given money, you need to prove that you're going to execute on what you're saying you're going to do. And they want to make sure that from a grant execution perspective that you really have thought it out to make sure that it is feasible, because you don't want to, in your grant to say, okay, I'm going to have 5,000 to myself at say on a $10,000 grant, right? I'm gonna have a $5,000 grant to myself as director, producer, writer, and, that, and then, not pay anybody else or you know not have a plan for how you're going to have your work be shown be seen have an impact and things like that so so there are some considerations and um there probably could be some better ways that they can 
extrapolate that information from people, but it, it is te- it just as tedious as it is to, to apply for it. It is just as tedious, I think, for the grant reviewers. And, and so I do think there are ways that they can kind of call down that information. Yeah, I think it's a it's a real it's a mixed bag. Um, you know, I'm from here. Most of my opportunities have come from outside of Minnesota, so I take issue with Minnesota being the most robust grants artist grants funding per capita in the country. But for, you know, like again, SPNM was number one, but after that, like Sundance, Chicago, the biggest documentary fellowship, not you know, that's in Chicago choosing me for projects that Minnesota grants are turning me down for left and right. To me, that doesn't make sense. When you couple it with the fact that there is plenty of politics at play in the grant system, um, especially if you don't have a certain privilege um, of either um, two kinds of privilege. The obvious one is if you're white. The other one is, they want you to show you, you know, X amount of work symbols or what have you done. Um, but they're, they're <laughs> what they consider to be experience, especially in the film world, is like drastically different. Well, it, it, it negates people's lived experiences. Like most white people who make a living making film, I know that they picked up a camera before they were 18. From here to independent circles to Hollywood. Right, like, um, but the thing is, like, the pandemic happened. So you know, SPNN and Sundance, they were the best with like supporting the artists. Like, there were certain deadlines in the fellowships and whatever, and and check ins about like where are you at with the progress, blah blah blah. And like, that's my uh, six show in the background. Um, you got to get out of here. Like, this is to the public. You got to get out of here. <laughs> and. Um, um, I just don't like having my kid on the internet. But uh, yeah, it's like things were holding us up, can't go into prisons, this and that. And it's like, I was nervous, like, wait, like Sundance gave me money to make a short film. At some point I told him, this is not a short film. We all know it. It's gonna be the feature or four part miniseries. And I'm like sweating bullets cause like they partnered with Marshall Project. You signed a contract that said, deliver us this film preferably by September of this year or the next year or whatever. And they were like, I don't worry about it. Like the project needs to be what it needs to be. And I've seen, and it wasn't just me, I've seen like funders really ride the backs of other artists that I know in a very uh, inequitable way. Well, let's just say in sometimes very racist ways. Um, So then bringing that all back to applications, oh my God. I think there is, there are some fine lines for sure. Um, frankly, it's a game I'd rather not play. Um, I say five for every five grants that are worth applying for, I'll apply to one. So I'm like really cutting my chances down by by a lot because you know you gotta throw your hat in the ring, throw your hat in the ring, throw your hat in the ring. But for me personally, I'm like, are there any children in this? For me, I'm like that you know um i only have like the energy to apply for like 20 percent of what i should be applying for and i'm gonna take the hits as a result in terms of like the odds of getting a yes but uh uh that's not why i started making films to beg for money like uh <laughs> well to beg for money through all of these gymnastics you gotta play because most, you know, outside of SPNN, like they could definitely use more funding, but look at who they serve. A lot of black and brown people, They're like go figure. They don't have a lot of funding compared to other organizations who give out $20,000, $30,000 or whatever. And the thing is like for, for doc, I'll make fiction too, don't get me wrong. So I got Jerome last year to, for my documentary project. My budget, like if you, if you look at trends and how the market is, like I'm not trying to make my film necessarily for public access. I went down that road, they want all your rights, not interested. Um, it's cool if you do, but in, in this particular piece that I'm making currently, I'm not willing to give up my rights in that way. Um, $30,000 toward a project that is minimum half a million dollars to make is not a lot of money. 
And, and, and while we sure we can be grateful, but the second someone says, just be grateful, you got something, I'm done talking to you because that means you don't understand how this works in terms of production, right? And so it's, it's interesting weighing all of that uh, because for 30 grand, I can make three really good short films, fiction, you know? So, you know, it's, it's navigating it like month to month, year to year. We all got lives, families. Um, I know like a Jerome sculpture artist once was like dealing with a lot and had to spend a lot of that money just on survival, you know? And hopefully Jerome supported them. I believe it's Eleanor over there. Hopefully they supported that person because like no one predicted the pandemic, right? So yeah, I think there's a lot. I think there's a lot to be said. Uh, I know that the Hollywood, especially around screenwriting, you know, the people who I know work in some studio spaces, they tell me straight up, like like Warner, HBO, some of these, uh, some of uh, Lena Waits uh, initiatives. They, some have gotten them somewhere on the inside and they straight up will tell me, we, we don't read all the scripts. No, no way we read all the scripts. Someone told me yesterday, I may, like we wouldn't have read I May Destroy You because we, we, at that time we had never heard of Michaela Cole. Yeah. Right, so when, <laughs> when there's like 800 applicants or 1200 applicants, for me, I can now kind of start to see who actually reads these samples because if I made it to the finals of Sundance Episodic Lab in 2021 and they have 2,500 applications and that same script didn't make it in the pool of 200 applications, I'm just going to think they didn't read my shit. And I know people in that got it because they knew somebody. <laughs> so it's like really hard to just like the mental gymnastics of trying to like not become a conspiracy theorist to me isn't even worth it, which is why I like look at five opportunities and I'll pick one to apply for and then go about my day and, and be with my family and just keep trying to be creative and write. If I, you know, if I just got to write, I just got to write in terms of uh, my scripts. So it's, it's a mess. Um, the, 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 the initiatives overall are still pandering towards a lot of people with privilege. Um, uh, <laughs> I don't even want to go down this road because I should just recuse myself. I just want to quickly piggyback on what uh, uh, Tommy was saying. Um, these, these folks, it's funny because sometimes if you look in the fine print and I can't remember what it was, but it was, I think it was like a screenwriting competition actually. And they said, we will only read up to 20 pages or something. And if we like it, then we'll continue to read more. And, uh, and I've also spoken to people who've said, you know, it's like, man, you think that we got time to read all this shit? <laughs> so it's just like, it's the weirdest thing because you could be wasting, and I know grants are usually free, right? But even when you think about other things that might uh, propel your career that cost 30 bucks, whether it's a competition or some other whatever thing, initiative or something to get you in there, you're just giving them money because they're not going to read your shit. And I've worked on productions where, you know, and I hate to blast them out, but like even Sundance, man, I worked on the house of tomorrow and uh, I know they're not in the room. And if they are, you know what I'm saying? They might, they might get my ass for this one, but they're like, yo, keep it on the down low because you know, we're going to have this in our festival. And it's like, you're having your, you're making your own movie. You're going to put in your own festival. You know, damn well, you're not looking at other people's shit. You know, and I guess that was for the feature film stuff. I don't know how it works in the shorts because I know people got their stuff in there through the shorts. Um, and one other person I know won the the doc, the doc feature. But it's just like it's the weirdest thing. It's like y'all are really political out here and doing this in in weird ways that it makes it hard for the person who's really trying to break in or for the small for the small person. So you know, it's almost like you got to really strategically look at certain things and ask yourself, is it worth your time, your money, uh, and all that? <laughs> because you could just be giving somebody, uh, you know, their Subway sandwich meal that day by giving them 30 bucks. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I want to say, so Tommy posted something in the chat 
Um, none, of, none of the words being said are to discourage people from applying to no. grants. No. However, no. I think there is something beautiful about the transparency because most of the people here have been doing the work. Um, and I think it's also just that I, I found it interesting to be watching multiple different mediums for people kind of maneuver this great um, funded landscape that we have in Minneapolis. And it's often just people of color on the other end being like, I know there's money. How do I get the money? And everybody else is like, has access to it in way easier ways than we do. Um, and I mean, for some validation, Tommy, I don't, it's not, it's not really a conspiracy theory. I don't, I, I don't think it's that mysterious on what's going on. I don't think most most artists of color think it's that mysterious. Um, but it's one of those things where it's like, what are some of the things that we think could improve outside of people just not being racist, like just calling it what it is, but what are some of the things around applications and even the process that would make it feel more accessible? Like have like, like when y'all have been applying, has it been like, oh damn, like if this was different, like I think maybe this would be something that would be a better question or a better way of asking this or this requirement does, does, that doesn't feel necessary, but maybe this show of my work would be better to prove that I'm worthy of whatever the money is or that they're giving. I mean, if y'all wanna come back to grants, cool, but I like, I still, I had this idea and I wanna like do it with Bianca one day. It's just like find all the black, find all the black wealthy people and millionaires uh, in Minnesota who claim that they love art. And we fucking like base essentially lock them in a room and say, there's all these artists here. You're gonna give all these artists in this room $10,000 each. They're gonna pitch you but they all get to walk out of here with 10,000 no matter what. And if you want to give them more than that, pull them aside and fund their project. But like they don't get to leave the room without writing checks. Because uh, if you go in these wealthy black people's homes, they have paintings worth $50,000, usually from white artists, on mm -hmm. their walls. And so how do we kidnap all these, <laughs> all these rich people and make them fund our stuff? Because <laughs> like it ain't going to, this ain't going to, this ain't, the grant ecosystem ain't going to cut it because people do give up on their dreams and uh, because they had to go get that extra shift at Domino's delivery and they just completely give up and they might have had the next like Donald Glover idea or a Michaela Cole idea. Man. Uh, I'm not even saying I, I know that's a fact. I just know that there's that's definitely a possibility that there's, there's people anywhere from the age of 15 to 50 um, that might have something with a lot of potential, but um, we're, we're, we are all kind of funneling each other and them because it's kind of like not our fault. We were given that, that, that scarcity survival instinct um, in this art space. But man, there are like, if, you, if, <laughs> if anyone knows these, these black millionaires in Minnesota specifically, who claim to love art. Again, there's a small requirement. They must say that they love the arts, which nine out of 10 will. Then what the heck are you doing to support uh, every generation of Black artists across genres, across mediums in this state? <laughs> like plausible deniability is out the windows 2022. We got to really like, we got to really like meet, catch me outside to a lot of people, you know? Hello. You talk about the pull up, yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, let's. I'm, I, I, I know that the cool thing is, is like I know we could pull it off. That's the thing. Like I'm, 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 I'm determined. If anybody could nicely that. kidnap somebody, <laughs> Bianca could nicely kidnap anybody. Um, but one of the questions was like, where do you find rich people? Um, I will say, from a, a lot of the spaces that I've been in, like who like to tokenize black talent and black artists who are like, oh yeah, like come to this space and we'll sponsor you or we'll do whatever, and, and our funders will come basically ogle and oogle at you and see if they like you but it's one of those things where donor lists you can often find donor lists like and you'll often see the names are very repetitive um and it's one of those things where it's just like look like looking for those people and oftentimes and I'm I, I kind of play in a lot of different worlds but like, like for example in the theater world like oh my god donors love to be validated and acknowledged and they like come up to you and they like poke and prod and they're like I gave you money this was great like they love to do that thing so oftentimes they show their faces um 
so yeah it, it, to typically if you tend to be like just in those spaces or read read pamphlets the back of things who's funding things like people have donors and even sometimes when you get funded from larger places um and you're and you have alterations in your project or you're like oh something came up and i want to change this sometimes that you'll get a pushback of like oh, well, like, this is fine, but like one of our donors doesn't really agree with the alteration. And then you start kind of hearing like, oh, there is these background forces that are actually the ones giving money. And like, there are conduits that we get the money from that, you know, all, all those different layers, but rich people are definitely accessible. They're out there and they love to get credit. So their names aren't that hidden. Yes, <laughs> on sides of buildings, on plaques, um, they love dinner parties to be able to brag and say that they did this and they did that. Um, I, I will say that for and sure. Can I, can I also say that like when we need to make certain collective pushes towards something we want, or even sometimes a collective no, believe me, we need some collective no's. Again, they, they will lowball us and then go to the next black and brown artist and be like, you'll take this $2,000 when you need 10. Hmm. And so nothing gets fixed, but like we need like these collective pushes can happen, but I do want to say we don't need to start collectives to make this change. Mm. Every time it's a bunch of, oh, let's start a collective, let's start a collective, let's start. No, we don't need all these damn collectives. We just need to make pushes collectively because at the end of the day, we need to live our lives the best way we, it fits into like what we have on our plate personally. But there are there are moments where we can come together and make certain pushes that doesn't involve like a, a brand new 501c3 or or this other like or even like organizationally speaking, I think organizations should be asking themselves, um, are we creating community or are we a business that serves community? There's a difference. <laughs> Right, that like is you can be serving community, say. but every every dollar, every every extra year you grow, revenue wise or financially, at the end of the day, the recognition goes to the organization and doesn't say, "Look at this community we built." So you can build community without it being focused on um, the entity itself. Thank you so much for saying that because I I, I ran into a specific situation where an organization like they had to give the money out because of all that was going on and it was almost like they were pressuring me even though the the back office logistics was nuts and i'm like talking to this person on the phone and asking questions they're asking you know square footage of your space and and how much you're using it for your art or how much you're using it not for your art all this kind of stuff but at the end of the day, that's that's what they care about is, no, we had to give this money away. We had to make sure that we gave this money out to X amount of BIPOC people. But are you really building community with me going back and forth over freaking <laughs> centimeters, square feet and all this kind of stuff? And I'm getting frustrated now. I don't even want the damn money because it's taking so long <laughs> to figure this stuff out. And then on the back end of the of the taxes and all this kind of stuff. And so it's just like we're uh, melanated folks are people, folks, we got to talk to you. We got to look at you. We need to body language. Some of these situations are so transactional. A lot of these organizations are very, very transactional and we're just not a transactional people. But you want our art, right? You want our work, you want us to, to, you know, fill in these quotas and statistics and stuff like that. But I mean, that means you need to come out your, your comfort zone. So if there's organizations where it, I may know your name, but I have never seen you, right, in person, you haven't, or I haven't seen you talk to any filmmakers that don't look like you, then it's like, that lets me know that you, this is a transactional. You know, so a lot of these situations, you know, they're just applying the, the same models to everyone. And a, a lot of these organizations need to just, they, they need to switch it up. Um, they need to be unafraid to switch it up and, and trust that the, the, the people that they're looking for will, will, will come to them or go to where they are. That's the other part, right? 
Um, and so it's, it's just really, really frustrating. <laughs> really, really frustrating. Um, and I, yeah, I, I've been enjoying people putting me in grants. Be like, all right, just gonna put me in there, girl. All right, <laughs> we will figure it out, okay? <laughs> like, fine, put me in there, but honey, I am not applying. <laughs> so. Oh, and that's a word because like I've been on a few panels where it's like, it's same thing too with, um, you know, George Floyd, for some reason, I don't know why it's just George Floyd on because it's been going on forever. But anyways, we'll say George Floyd on. <laughs> the way, same way that they've been calling for, you know, uh, filmmakers of color. Now, all of a sudden it's like, oh, we need to have more black people in these grants or, you know, more people of color in these grants. And it's like, well, okay, you have to do more than just <laughs> throw it at people, you know, yeah. you, you have to have had that connection. Yeah. You know, so it's 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 a thing now, though, because there have been a few grants I've been keeping my eyes on and it's like we're trying to get, you know, more BIPOC people included and involved. But it, it feels, again, very last minute and, and very opportune. Like I won't turn right. on the money. I, I won't lie. Right. But at the same time, it's like there has to have been that connection and not just because you're trying to fill that quota, trying to, you know, make yourself look appealable and mm -hmm. you're not that in, as an organization. Yeah, definitely not. I, I don't. I don't want the name dropping situation. I, I need to have seen you, talk to you. We need to have had a meeting. You know, don't just put my name on some stuff and then I'm supposed to show up type of situation. Like that's, that's not okay either. And then the other thing of, I've been running into organizations, which is fine. Cause I, you know, I have a beautiful vast network of, of amazing artists um but they, they they want these listservs or they want contacts and stuff and it's like like i said not everybody first of all not everybody's like that and then i gotta go back and see if it's cool you know what i'm saying on on me giving out information but the, again that's transactional like you know these are and then for me as, as a beautiful melanated person these are my people like I'm not just like sending you just some random list of folks that I just click on in some Excel spreadsheet on my thing like no nah, these are the homies I have worked with these people. Um, I, you know, I built teams with these people and stuff like that, and so if I hear about you mistreating my folks. <laughs> it's gonna be a problem so these kinds of things that just. That there needs to be more thought and intention and and uh, strategic. And I will I will say Jerome <laughs> has gotten better <laughs> with that and listening and being intentional and showing up in spaces and asking questions and letting and letting us talk candidly about you know the process or lack thereof or lack of support. Um, so yeah. But and I mean also I think one uh, Tommy I, I like I quoted you by the way I wrote that down quote us about that quote about the community and the, yeah um, but I will say like even being being trans like having funders be a little bit more transparent because they oftentimes come with the like community appeal and it's like I've never seen your face before so like just call it what it is like just call it what it is like and I'm not saying I'm everywhere all the time but I'd be outside enough to see some people's faces and it's like I've and I'm in tons of like spaces of color so if there was a white person just wandering around the space I would have seen their face and it's like I've never seen you in public like what are you talking about just call it what it is like you're a business who's serving community you're not anything community oriented grassrooted nothing like that, that, that's not that's not what you're there to do which I also think changes the parameters and like while you were talking about kind of like the like the post the post George Floyd era I think artists and I, I, my and my one of my hopes I feel like artists have more authority to demand what they're wanting um I think oftentimes it feels like a handout sometimes and, pe and, I, and I've seen a lot of artists of color be very sheepish and like kind of shy away from advocating for themselves in those spaces. And it's like, they need you as much as you need them because mm -hmm. if they don't have any place that their money is going, they don't keep getting it. Like they have to show that they did something with it. And it's just like, I've, I've taken pride in like finding and being in community with people who are like pushing the envelope with that. But even like, um, 
a friend of mine has a dance has, has, a, has a dance um, organization and she didn't want to have the the standard performance aspect that came from this cohort of eight months and it was like I don't want to I, I, I don't want a performance piece it's the middle of COVID it's a pandemic artists want to heal themselves work on their craft do the thing and they're like bet we love the idea we'll give you the money but basically how, what do we get in return for giving you the money and then so like that was kind of how it was posed and she's like you get nothing you gave the money because that's your job is to give the money and then it came to a point of really having the conversation of no our funders give this money in the hope of seeing something so we paid for you to dance so we want to see you dance mm. and so it's like when you really start mm. having the conversations I just like I think I've seen more and more artists kind of take control of that a little more of like this is a place of business and going into it with, you're not my friend. You don't really care about my community. You have money you need to get rid of. I'm here to help you with that. And yep. these are the things that I need for me and my people. And these are the requirements. And it's not like a, oh, thank you so much. I'm grateful what you're, for what you're offering. It's like, no, this is a business, inter like, this is a business exchange. Like this is what needs to be happening. And I think I've seen that happen in a lot of other art practices and I haven't seen it happen as much in film yet. Mm. Right, I feel like film does take so much for everybody to adequately get paid for a project. It's like the numbers feel outrageous, but when but when you see a well-funded project, it Listen. just looks beautiful. Oh and my gosh. Like, and everyone's happy and they want to work together again. You know? Yeah. No, it, it really needs to yeah, on on both ends. The av the advocacy and the organizations need to to be realistic and, and say because right now because of all the craziness people is moving their money away <laughs> so the organization big organizations that have been around like for example united way that whole situation completely mm -hmm. different they have been giving money for 100 by 100 years and then when things have changed, now all these organizations that have been getting the same money for so long, it's like, mm -hmm. oh, you don't, you don't have any BIPOC people on your board? We're not giving you any more money. Mm -hmm. that, that's, where, that's where we're at now with a bunch of organizations where these big funders, if we don't see what is going on on your board, we taking our money away. Mm -hmm. Have 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 you guys found it easier to advocate for yourselves since like the post the George Floyd era, or do you still kind of feel like when you're I guess looking for funding, there's a lot a lot more negotiation yeah. still happening. Look, <laughs> I'm always willing to, to like. I love Bonnie and all of you, but if you never invite me back because I said something on here, I'm I'm okay with that going into. <laughs> But the thing is, like, I really have nothing negative to say about SPNN. I just might say some negative stuff about other things and whatever. But that's the thing. And look, I'm looking at Zania, I'm looking at Allison, and like, I'm looking at Bianca. Like, if y'all, especially, keep it that real with a funder and you don't get funded, we know exactly why you didn't get funded. <laughs> Now, for, now, one level up from that, a black man keeps a real 50-50 chance. They got a white partner, 85% chance. Yep. Uh, they want to be best friends and go to happy hour and do axe throwing with that funder, 90% chance. And my, my thing is, like, I'm going to stay all the way down here. I'm with my people. I'm with my community. I think Ricky, Ricky, uh, Ricky Monique has a new song out <laughs> and like in the lyrics in the song she's like all my friends are black like <laughs> most people ain't willing to say that publicly you know what i'm saying <laughs> like the thing is the work she makes is because of who she is mm. not because she's trying to fix certain boxes to get five thousand here ten thousand there and you know what it's gonna be a struggle and i was gonna type in the chat like i still got maxed out credit cards from making my last short film yeah, here. The only, the only thing, the only thing I recommend from people is save their on first, second, or third, or fourth short film. Uh, you know, allow yourself to have those bumps. Allow yourself to be on those roller coasters, roller coasters, and have those challenges. 
But my from project to project, when it comes to like my fiction stuff, I'm always just trying to take off more hats per project. So if I had to wear 30 hats on my first short, great. Down to 20 on my second short, great. Down to 10 hats on my third short. So my next short, I only want to wear like five hats. I just want to keep reducing the amount of hats I have to wear because we've gone through those experiences of how, like David mentioned, how extremely hard it is. You can't even explain it. Um, Because film is a medium where everyone has to be at the same place physically at the same time. If I'm a musician, not that that's easy, but I can make the track over here. I can send you the we transfer download. You can add to it, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, definitely embrace the challenges and don't think that that's always going to be that way. But set certain standards for yourself um, to, to, to accept less hardship the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. And when you do that and you have to deal with certain institutions, always ask yourself, will I be able to tell the generation behind me to stand up for themselves? Because mm. there's a thing called Google and there's a thing called like, if you're actually in community, you can just ask people, right? Like Zania said, I've never seen your face. Mm. So, you know, be careful what you say that you, you being anybody, perceived to be the truth, <laughs> you know? Because like, Donald Trump ain't the only one lying. Like, there's people in our own community that just be lying, right? <laughs> And this is, I'm, I'm done with all that. Done. I'm all about working smarter, not harder. Like I, I enjoy being on productions and such and, and producing. Well, first of all, I went to a whole institution and managed to get out of there and not even know what a producer was until after I graduated. What, what, how did that happen? Um, but, but, um, be, becoming the jack of all trades and doing all the things, you know, you just end up doing all the things and, and being collaborative and, um, the history of black Hollywood has always been collaborative and stuff like that. And we're always, uh, we going to figure it out. You know, if we all on the same page and for the vision and the dream, we going to figure it out. But I am all about smarter, not harder for the next 40 years of my life um, instead of trying to do every single thing. And so that is the best advice that you gave, Tommy, saying, you know, as you move and do different productions to, to do less, less work, less hats, you know, more delegations, stuff like that. So, um, Everybody needed to hear that. <laughs> David, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, just bringing up the, the grants and kind of going back to what could make it easier. I think, uh, Bianca, you sent out a grant thing. I can't remember what it was. CDP or something like that. Mm-hmm. So, something like that. But what was interesting about that one was um, you got to pick the questions. So they wrote like maybe 10 or something like that. And then they just said, pick two. And then you got to kind of write in your own answer. Like if, if it could be easy and like you could say it in your own words. And I also emailed them too, because I had a question about something on the application and they just emailed back uh, fairly quickly and just said, you know, gave a very simplistic answer. So it's like, there's certain things that would be cool like that. I still don't, I'm still not the grant guy. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not a firm believer in them, but I think that's one way of just making them easy. And just in terms of like, you know, the actual work and doing it, you know, it's always, uh, it's always tough because if you do get some money, then you can delegate and, and give some people some funds to help you out. I think, you know, this is one of the things we struggle with a lot. And, uh, I don't want to say it's a Minnesota thing because that seems like kind of a cop out, but it's so uh, like there's a lot of things that are a Minnesota thing. Yeah, it's just because <laughs> so I mean, people got to work and stuff, and like you know, it's so hard because it's like doing the project and having and doing just one thing is like so difficult. This I can't even imagine doing one thing to be honest. I mean, when I'm hired to do that one thing, it's so nice. But like in terms of it being my project, it's I could 
I can't even, I honestly can't even fathom it. You know, maybe if I had like a hundred K that I could hire everybody and be like, great, I get to do this one thing. And I know that I bet there's a way to do it. I bet there's a way to do one thing, but just in my mind, it's like, and I think somebody wrote Don't even compute. Yeah, <laughs> like the Jack of all trades thing. It's like, look, at, there's a school, there's this school of filmmaking, like the Robert Rodriguez rebel without a crew. He did it by himself. He had a partner, Carlos, but he basically did the film by himself. Right. So there's that school of filmmaking. And then there's the other school of like, you get plugged into a system. Right. And that means you're actually going out there, like, let's say Los Angeles, and you're just working and you're making your way up through the ranks. And now you're plugged into the system for anybody who thinks that you can't just get a job in film. I'm gonna tell you right now, it's pretty easy. And they're looking for people, especially now, considering they got a bunch of slots to fill because of the pandemic. And so all this content they need, they're they're grabbing people off the streets. But that is crew work, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you can work in an office too, but that's not writing. That's not directing. Those spots are still hard to come up, come up. But if you have the gumption to come up through film or whatever. You can move to Atlanta, you can move to New York, you can move to LA and you could just start working right away. Hell, you could probably start working here in March once I get these productions going. So, <laughs> you know, you could just get going right away. But if you're trying to do something yourself, you might have to, you might have to put in a little elbow grease and, you know, get dirty and like do some stuff you don't want to do. Allison, do you have anything regarding like making grants easier or like a, like applying or making that process easier? Yeah, so maybe this is not a hack, but my hack is I literally use the same thing and just, you know, re-edit based off of what the ask is. Because when I go into like looking at grants, first of all, I make sure that it's something that could like could potentially suit what my project is headed for. Like if there aren't any parameters, then yeah, sure, we'll, we'll throw it in there. But then if there's like certain requirements around it, I take the information that I had from before, because again, they, they generally ask for the same thing over and over and over again, right? So once you've had that, those big buckets of things, um, you, you just tweak it for whatever that project asks for. And, you know, each, and each time too, because again, like I have um, like my Google Doc area where I keep every grant that I've applied for, the questions, the answers, so that if somebody does come back with an, a, same, a similar question or answer, copy, paste, edit with, with the information. And, and with each year, you kind of grow too with, um, you know, understanding yourself as a filmmaker, understanding yourself as a person. So you also just basically re-edit that same stuff over and over. So that's kind of like my personal hack because I do get mad when I apply, like something like, why are they asking for this question? And, and you're like pressing buttons and punching a keyboard, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's like, um, like I, again, my, my um, projects are very situational where I have been trying to grow with each project, but again, a lot of that too sometimes is restricted by how much money you can get, how much money I have saved, how much is available, which is part of one of the reasons why I, you know, stepped away from trying to be a freelancer because I did give that a try for like a year or so, but then knowing that my passion and, and, and again was working for me, working on my projects, not that I wouldn't help other people, but those rarely ever paid in. Again, I, I didn't want to have like film or like filming or production be a sore spot because I loved it so much. I'm like the way that I can make it happen, even though it lengthens the amount of time that I get to do stuff is let me have my full time job so I can at least pay my bills and protect you and, and also fund my projects. But then knowing that this gives me a little bit more give than say I was depending on somebody else. Um, you know, from like a freelancer per perspective to right. be able to then, you know, first pay myself and then maybe squeeze some money to then fund my project. So I thought about, you know, um, the whole going to LA, um, Atlanta, I'm not that kind of person. I will drown and it's in, in a big sea of people doing all the same things. And, you know, I like, again, I'm special, but I'm not that special. So my thing is to focus on me, do what I can here, make connections with people who are, you know, in my same avenue arena, up, up, down, doesn't matter, in Minnesota and figure out how I can work, you know, from that. And, and right now grants has been the thing. Once I figure out how to talk to rich people, I'll hit that too, you know? So. We, we gonna do that event. Listen, I, 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 <laughs> and it's gonna I'll, be I'll kidnap if we go. <laughs> so like, I'm giving away this, I'm giving away that. The only, reason I'm, the only reason I'm giving away all the IP is because I like want all of you there. <laughs> but it's like, like, first of all, you can tell anybody an idea. It's got to be executed originally, right? 
so we can all do this. And, and it, what made me think of that was when uh, I grew up, I'm 30, about to be 38. So I grew up East Coast, West Coast battle hip hop. And, uh, you know, they, they uh, Quincy and Puff Daddy, they had that whole summit, like to bring the East West Coast yeah. rappers together. Like, what the, what are we doing? Like, now it's not the exact same context, but no, it's I like, it. we need to have this rich black people in Minnesota summit. Because again, if you look on their walls, and, and, and shit, they got apps. You can scan that thing. <laughs> and that thing was made in Belgium, that painting that they paid $50,000 for. Like, excuse me? Um, meanwhile, like, too many names to name of talented artists in so many different mediums right here in Minneapolis alone. All black and brown. <laughs> you know, too many names to name. Um, but yeah, like, uh, for anyone who, like, because I just see people's names, if anyone's in the group that happens to be a screenwriter or wants to, there's a group in like, you know, proceed with caution on any Facebook group, but this one's called Black Screenwriters. It's run by a guy named Craig T. Williams. It's on Facebook and you take what you want out of it, but there's sometimes good conversations happening. And the thing is, it's not just screenwriters chiming in, it's crew people. Um, who are on like different unions, in Atlanta, Los Angeles, New York, chiming mm -hmm. about, and it's mostly from an independent lens, even though they're like in the in industry, but no one's like millionaires. Um, everybody's just trying to like do what they love. So that's a good group in Facebook. And then I say like, mo the best relationships I have with filmmakers outside of like people I know here in town are, that like 95% of the conversations we have, we're not even talking about film. You just gotta get to know people. Like they have the same exact interests as you um, in terms of the world of film. But like, if I end up in a writer's room anytime soon, it'll be because of a couple of people I know. Uh, and like, we never talk, like we rarely ever talk about writing or film. But we, the little we do talk about, we know how passionate we are about what we're doing. And we're all just like encouraging one another. Uh, uh, someone brought up, I think Michael brought up community. It's like, yeah, definitely like, we encourage each other's passions, but our genuine encouragement comes from getting to know each other on just as people. Um, and, and that's always like, I got a buddy in Miami, he makes dope stuff. I love all his stuff, but when we get together, we don't even talk about it. You know, we, we know we're watching each other's stuff. We know we're rooting for each other, but you know, <laughs> that's always a good way to go is just keep it organic. Yeah, I mean, it's a collaborative effort, you know, and it really, like this industry more than anything is that you, who you know. And yeah, you may know the folks all on the same level, but they may know somebody who knows somebody. And and, and sometimes like, I, like I've been in some of those groups that um, Tommy just mentioned, or even when you follow like screenwriters, Twitter, and you see, you know, random people getting signed to writers rooms and things like that, that that's inspirational because you know, okay, well, if they can do it, then definitely I can too. But at the same time, it's like, you can't, you, you've got to be okay with being out there. And, and I'm an introvert, so it's mad difficult for me. But at the same time, like I try to do what I can, like if it's a matter of sitting on a board, volunteering, if I can, if I have that ability, like that is my way to connect with people. And, you know, so it, it really is just making sure that from relationship, keep it organic, put yourself out there, even though it's scary. Yeah, you definitely gotta be out of your comfort zone. Cause let me tell you, Film North, <laughs> in my experiences um, early on, very, very white space. But I, because I wanted to be in, in the industry and I wanted to be around different people who were doing different things, um, I went into those spaces, even not really knowing anybody and stuff like that. But yeah, it's, it's really about um, uh, uh, taking a chance stepping out of your comfort zone, building authentic relationships. Like Tommy knows, like if he just texts me and he needs a cord, I'm literally can just give, give him the cord. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like building um, and stuff and, and genuinely wanting people to succeed, you know, um, wanting people to grow, um, and see their journey like it's it's 
there's been a lot of really cool uh, full circle moments for me with a lot of different people, a lot of different artists where, you know, you remember, like, remember I had introduced you and, and you did this on Candy Fresh and now you have your own show on TBS. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It was like, but you, you was on my show first, remember? So like, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing to, um, to build and foster those relationships. So that, that's a big, big part of it. Cause then they remember your name, like, oh, well, I know this really cool writer, you know, they would be great. So, and the way they are bringing people in and out of these writing rooms, <laughs> all these different episodes of, of, of TV series switching up and stuff like that. You don't know what the hell you go. <laughs> like the person who knew, like the showrunner for Grand Crew was on the Insecure writing room, you know? So stuff like that, where it's, it, again, everybody Insecure has been staffed. And like, if there was a job, that would have been it, but unfortunately they ended. But it's like, again, those relationships, those connections, it, if it's all authentic, it, it, it's a chance. Yep. In the Cut, uh, if you guys use Instagram, anyone out there, In the Cut LA, I-N-T-H-E-C-U-T-L-A. In the Cut LA, um, this woman I know, Ray Benjamin, she, she created that like maybe two years ago um to like give like as much resources to black and brown people who want to be in the film industry and she's like the most humble person who's like on the rise out there on the west coast and she like was an animator made her own little series worked in a whole different field but then she started writing and um every she'll tell you every opportunity she got was through like some gen some type of genuine relationship. Not not like, I mean, yeah, you gotta have writing samples. Now if we're talking about writing, you gotta have some writing samples. But like it was all through relationship. Every so she, you know, now she's writing on two Netflix shows. And it was not because she was in the game for X amount of years. She was literally in the game for like no amount of years. But people, writers who she did know, they had genuine like having nothing to do with film relationships. And then they look and say, oh, Ray, but you write too. And you made your little web, web series and the stuff that might not be amazing, but we definitely put our blood, sweat and tears into it. And that's just how. So if you follow in the cut, um, she always, you know, if there's a if there's a fellowship opportunity or this and that, she's always posting about that stuff. She's always uh, she's done her own seminar. So just get into that and like learn. Right. Because like. Networking is important, but if you're not working on your craft, it don't really matter who you know, because at the end of the day, they're going to be like, uh, they're not going to say, what is this thing that, you know, I'm looking at here? They're going to say, what what else have you like been working on? And it's not even about whether it's any worthy, you know, Atlanta script. It's about like, can I see from script one to five or one to three? Are you the only way you're improving is if you're working on it? And so they don't always want to see like an Oscar winning script. They just want to see uh, like how much skin you're actually putting in the game for yourself. Like, how are you serving yourself so that I can vouch for you and bet on you? Cause I'm like, that person really wants this, you know? Well, we have only 15 minutes left, correct? Is there any, I guess we should have some room for questions, maybe a couple questions. Yeah, there was one question in the chat um, from SPNN family. Um, for, for, for smaller organizations like SPNN, what are some of the ways that we can better support media artists or that people are looking for to be supported in? Are you asking us? <laughs> <laughs> yes, David. <laughs> How can SPNN support uh, media, media artists? artists? Yeah, like better support media artists. Um, do y'all still have youth programming there? In flux. Okay. Yeah. Okay, because I was going to say that's, I mean, I came up through youth programming. 
So I think you could help the next gen by doing that. And that was really good. Um, and it was, uh, you know, I mean, I think, yeah, if you do that, that that's probably number one, I would say, um, for people who are just media artists in general, I think, um, that's a good question. You know, resources are always nice. So, you know, whatever, whatever that means to you, I guess, if you had like easy grants that you can help people out with, you know what I'm saying? Cause like I said, I'm terrible at them. So I don't know if there's people there that could help with that. Like, yeah, we'll help you kind of craft grant writing or, um, I mean, you got a space, you got a studio, you got equipment. So things like that could be helpful. Um, so I don't know, you guys have always been kind of helpful to me. Um, so really, I think, I think the next generation probably needs it more than, I mean, I still need help. I ain't going to sit here and say, I don't need help, but you know, I think, you know, the next gen is where my head's at. Yeah. And I think accessibility is always key, but again, y'all have been doing that. Um, cause especially with the, you know, production grants that Minnesota is getting, um, the double incentives that's happening up North, you know, there's bound to be work coming, but I think a big thing too, that, you know, we, um, you know, we've been talking about with different organizations is just preparing that workforce. So definitely great to have the, the next, you know, batch of media makers, filmmakers, uh, you know, up and coming, but then, you know, for those who are currently in looking for that experience, looking for that exposure, you know, continue to offer those classes that allows them to, to borrow cameras and, you know, um, editing and things like that, that could definitely lend to, to, to just the, the grander scheme of production in, in the industry. Definitely. Uh, SBN, um, like, I just hope that- Training and skill set. I just hope that, you know, the city of St. Paul or somebody can give SBN more money so these youth programs can flourish. Uh, um, so that, you know, you know, I don't know the demographics of the youth that come in, but I, you know, if most of them are in St. Paul and more funding would make sure that like all the, you know, all the, you know, black and brown youth especially can get in from 25 miles out and in and they would even more funding, you know, 50, 100 miles out, man, just to come to SPNN. And um, I just think it's, uh, putting it on like a smaller organization um, isn't fair when the history of SPNN and the support they do give to people within their capacity is amazing. So really like, again, rich people give SPNN money. <laughs> like it really like, and it's not even like we're talking about create new money like, 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 the, like the feds. We're saying like rich people got exorbitantly richer in the pandemic, we're not just talking about Bezos, but any any random rich person that we go to the same grocery store as got ten times richer in a pandemic. Um, people with a lot of privilege cashed out on their like thirty, forty thousand dollars of you know economic assistance from the government. It's like uh, there shouldn't be a lot of questions asked. Like fund programs like SPNN, organizations like SPNN. Man like massively and then like you know because david said it like we'll take a back seat we want to see the generations not have to go through whatever it is we might have gone through as individuals as as peers around the same age you know like you know melvin carter step your game up and give more money to the arts i'll say that give less money to police give it to spnn and the other arts programs like straight up because you ain't Really, like, what are you doing? Yeah, thank y'all for that. Um, there's been a lot, a lot of questions about like finding artist community or finding film community specifically. Um, and do, do you all feel tapped into a, like a specific film community in Minneapolis? I have my own thoughts. But... <laughs> I'm a little bit of everywhere. And um, it is for me in my experience, more of the folks that I have worked with more than anything. So like, you know, I've been on a, on a couple of David's projects, he's been on a couple of mine. Um, there's some other folks in the community that I've, that I've worked with or, you know, just from a festival circuit 
getting access or, or just being able to be in touch with those folks. Um, so that for me, that's my community. Everything else in terms of, you know, the, the groups on Facebook, um, groups on Twitter, uh, definitely more of a bystander. And those just because again, I, I don't know, I don't know those people. I, I love to hear their stories. I contribute where, I, where it makes sense. Um, but for me, it's really have been the people that I've had exposure to and working with them and really building those relationships from. Yeah, I think the community builds when it's like people can remember who like showed up for each other. Um, so like, it, it, you know, Zania, David, Bianca, Allison need me to like hold a slate, hide a wire behind a plant. And I say that in terms of like momentum, because again, film, everybody physically has to be in the same space at the same time. So like we can all, we all definitely have good ideas and projects we want to make, but like if Allison's project is ready to go in, in May of 2022. And I know my project ain't got a chance till at the earliest November. I'm not gonna be like, Alice, well, I got this thing I'm working on. I can't help. No, like <laughs> I know I'm available in May because my shit ain't happening in May. <laughs> so it's like, uh, I think we should jump on momentum trains when we're trying to help each other out. Because again, speaking in the context that we don't have $100,000, uh, we should do that when we are free to do it. Uh, like, you know, once like EG needed a body, I'm like, I'm, my face probably won't even be in this. I hope not. But like, he needed bodies for a scene. You know, I'm like, I'm around. I live 10 minutes away. Like, I don't need to ask a lot of questions. It's like, I, we know how hard it is. So I think like mm. jump on momentum train. Now don't go work like, you know, four 12 hour days for free. Um, that's different than like, I remember on one of my films, the people that, the money I had left over, I gave to the people who insisted that they volunteer. But I, even the people who insisted that they volunteer, I wouldn't let them uh, help out for more than one day. Cause I was like, I just can't, like, I don't feel good. I'll find somebody else to do the slate tomorrow. I know you are willing to come. But other people are willing to come on a volunteer level. So let's let them come tomorrow. Um, and then whoever was left standing just got all left over. <laughs> like, like, you know, thanks for showing up. But also, like, I know that the, the some of the people I paid worked for a lot less than they make mm. on a day job. OK. And, um, <laughs> you know, so I gave them everything I had. You know, I gave them everything I had. Like, wow, you put in. 12, you know, you put in nine days for a total of what you make in one day in the, in, in the like, you know, Hollywood or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you just do what you can, keep it genuine. It goes without saying, keep everybody fed. But like, if you can show up to hold a slate or hide a cord because you're free that day, do it. Because then your community will build. You'll build the community because it's real. Like, it's, it's all passion. Like, you know, no one went to that's a whole nother conversation. Like, should people mm. go to film school? You know, mm. should people take uh, screenwriting courses and all that? Like, yeah. man, that's a whole nother conversation. But just <laughs> show up when you can. Be genuine. Be genuine, and and just know that, like, if people. Oh, best best thing. Say no when you can't do something. Like, don't give a half yes. Mm. And then, and then, oh, I gotta walk my dog. Can't make oh, it. No. You know what I'm saying? Uh -uh. Like, just say like, I, my favorite answer is either no, or in, in the film community, my favorite answer is no. In general, my favorite answer is I don't know. <laughs> okay, it's okay to just not also not show up if you're not gonna actually show up in the end. Yeah, I, that is I so agree true. With uh. I agree with Tommy. I think, you know, when I have time, I will, I'll be there if I say yes to it. If I don't say yes, that means I ain't coming. So <laughs> that's pretty clear. I mean, uh, I don't know if that's the LA thing seeped into me because nobody in LA says no. And if they don't say anything, that basically means no, you know, it's sort of the <laughs> same thing. Um, but, you know, uh, if I do have time, I usually like, because I try to help people out. But I think also, kind of going back to the youth thing, you know, there was a, a space where people could just kick it called Phillips Community Television, which merged mm. into Intermedia Arts. I remember those days. 
Yeah. And so it's like when you had like a place like Intermedia Arts where you could just chill and talk and whatever. And it was just artists. It was all kind of artists, not just filmmakers. You know, I think a space like that would be cool, you know, and all kind of people were there, youth and adults and things. So I don't know if there is a space like that, like just off the top of my head, I can't even think of a spot that's like there, that. There is a space, but a lot of people don't know about it. It's a creator space downtown St. Paul. At least they're trying they're trying to make it that type of space, but definitely it's it's a co-op situation, but it really is a becoming this beautiful collective of just everyone kind of working together or supporting one another. Um, okay. There's little pockets, there's little pockets of spaces that just a lot of people just don't know. And I try me as a connector and as an advocate, I'm always trying to pull people in um, to experience those different spaces and stuff. But yeah, they 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 definitely exist. Yeah, creator space is a, is a good is a good one. The only thing I would uh, say about them is, the, you know, it's downtown St. Paul, so the parking right. sucks. Right, parking is terrible. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> it's like you try to park out there, you might end up with a ticket. So yes. if, they're, if they could somehow make a free parking lot or something like that where people could go, I mean, just having having that, I think, is a humongous help. Um, because once you're in a space with other creators and you can just chop it up about you know, I don't, I don't know who said, maybe it was Tommy who said, it's like, you don't even talk about film half the time. It's like, when you can just talk about life and, you know, it becomes, that really does become community and you're just making friendships at that point. Um, and that's the best thing, you know, no, nobody ever wants to be around that person who wants something from them. You know what I mean? Unless you go be straight up clear about it. Like, I yeah. just want this thing from you. And then I can then say yes or no, but if you know somebody's like really trying to, you know, it's like, man, I know you're a black filmmaker and I would really love it if you could just be on my project so I could have a black person on my project so that way I can get funding because you're black. Listen, <laughs> like you better like, say that. That's weird, man. It's like, dude, get out of here. I don't want to <laughs> talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> but it happens. It, ha it happens. And it happens a lot here in Minnesota. Oh, please believe. Oh, yes straight up used <laughs> used yeah. no 1000 percent. 1000 percent. yep i wanted to uh, add to to tommy on the uh the uh momentum thing because i remember when he was doing white tears and we had our little field trip at uh the axe man looking for different types of props and stuff and so sometimes um and then sometimes those are good for your spirit, right? Like you're dealing with some craziness and stuff and you just get the random phone call like, hey man, I gotta find something that looks like a bomb. Like, wait, what? <laughs> wait, wait, okay. <laughs> Let me just wrap this up right quick and uh, we're gonna go to x -Men and see what we can find. And we, we might wanna be careful because we don't want them thinking that we, <laughs> <laughs> that was so much fun so you know a lot of filmmaking stuff doesn't necessarily have filmmaking sometimes it's props you know sometimes it's trying to find an asthmat suit I think we were trying to find an asthmat suit and something that looked like a bomb <laughs> in, in X-Men and y'all if you're familiar with X-Men you know that X-Men got something like that somewhere they, they just need to find it in the back so, so yeah, I'll never forget that, bro. That was hilarious. <laughs> and Wynn got some really good food after. <laughs> well, and and Bianca, you know, SPNN gave me the studio space to film uh, yep. a, a little a little portion, uh, and a lot of uh, Bianca and, and other black friends came out for a couple hours. I want to say, well, yeah, one night and just you know stood in and let us do our thing and let us direct them like some impromptu stuff and uh it was in the film and that was like boom there's your community right there like oh yeah what do you need you know and like i mean and it's just like it's it's all love because there's been times where i'm like yeah okay, i need this gear i need some gear and i like come and like well i mean this ain't exactly what i'm looking for but <laughs> 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 
and, and that goes to my point. Like St. Paul give give uh, SPNN like a lot more money, like <laughs> five times whatever their budget is right now. It's it's not it's not even a question of whether or not it's doable for these you know municipal funders. Well, it's three o'clock, y'all. Can I ask? Can I ask one question? Um, you all have alluded to youth quite a bit, and we actually have several of our SBN youth who are on today viewing. And if you could just um, give some advice to them uh, about maybe kind of moving forward or how how they can, um, you know, get more experience and that kind of thing, or how you you know, if you've got something words of wisdom you could share. Well, I'll say uh, community productions, we are always um, enjoying having our young people come and, and sit in on the studio um, and uh, learn or watch. Um, if anytime you see me in the control room, I feel free to knock and, and say hello. I'm always welcoming. Um, always. Um, well, first and foremost, as, as young people, the biggest and most important thing I can tell you ever is believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. Us grown adults out here is dealing with imposter syndrome, like ridiculously. And when some of us are truly amazing, fantastic at what we do, but believing in yourself is is one of the biggest things believe that you can actually create the pieces that you that you want and that you will attract your tribe so you'll attract the people that you need to help you make it happen so um and then of course spnn we're always here for you so whatever you need um, to make your project happen but those are the biggest uh things i could tell you is community productions opportunities and believe in yourself yeah, and speaking of community, you know, that's, yeah, you, that's your community right there. Figure out how to work on each other's projects, you know, figure out, like, it doesn't have to be anything big. It can be like a small, let's try a five minute thing because we're all part of this cohort now, you know, because a lot, like, I never went to film school. A lot of my experience was on being on other people's sets and then trying stuff out myself when I realized I wasn't getting the experience that I really was looking for and needed. So, like, just figure out what, like, know your goal and then work with each other to get something out. It doesn't always have to be monetary. Get creative about how you can get through things or, or film in certain locations or work with other people. But as long as it, you know, it sounds like you'll have a, a community already and there's that cohort there, definitely start there. Yeah, I, I would say um, since I came up as a youth like programmer, right? I got into it, I was 12. And then I started working around 14 um, on doc on doc work. So I would say how it worked for me is I, I was just learning a lot. Um, the more you learn, you kind of figure out what you want to do. So if you can consume as much as possible, that's going to help you out in your future. So whatever it is, you know, that you want to do, start doing it now, whether that be writing or shooting or directing and try out everything, you know, so even if you think you might not like something, give it a shot, give out lighting a shot, give out art department a shot. Um, and then, you know, I think the next step is once you kind of figure out your, your, your place and you, and you, you want to go for it, then the next step is like to just not give up. <laughs> you know, it's, I think it's what Bianca was saying is believe in yourself. Cause a lot of the time, um, and I don't do this as much anymore, but it, I would do things in spite of people because they wouldn't believe in me. So I had to believe in myself. Um, and now that's a little yes, less so because I think people, you know, it's funny when you see the reactions when you do something that somebody says you couldn't do. And it's sort of lazily how they are. And you're just like, why did I do that anyways? <laughs> why did I do that to just to spite your face? So it's like it's weird. But I think. Um, yeah. And then it just becomes, you're going to know if you love it or not. Right. The more you do, the more you learn, uh, the more you say, like, I'm not going to give up. And then you kind of get to a spot of like, you know, this is going to be your life. And then you kind of fall, kind of fall into place. Um, but that's what I say. And if, yeah, if, 
you know, you're going to SPNN, that's a great spot. Um, cause they got a lot of, they got a lot of great things there and I got nothing bad to say about them. I agree with everybody. Um, just be yourself. Uh, this really talented young brother I talked to was a filmmaker down in Miami, makes a lot of good stuff. And he like sent me his latest script. And I was like, dog, you, you make this order winning stuff. And the script you sent me, looks like an insecure episode. That's not who you are. And he's like, but the thing is, it wasn't his fault. He wrote it that way. It's like, we put, this last thing I want to say, like we put certain mental pressure on ourselves. and I got news for it for you. It's most of it's not real. Like what the, the stuff we're telling ourselves about our, uh, what we should be making or our competency, like Bianca talked about a plastic syndrome. It's like a different version of just things in our head um, that has less to do with imposter syndrome, just more of like pressure. Like I, if I don't do it this way, like that isn't like, that's not real. That stuff in our heads is not real. And once we let that go, that's when our, like our best creative selves can problem solve, right? Then any other job, you go to a job interview, they're like, how do you solve problems? Or tell us about a time on the past job where you solved the problem. I'm like, look, we, we're, we're lucky, we're creative. Every problem we solve, and it can be a creative one. Like it's just in our bones that this is what you love, you know, art. So yeah, just tap into that and like remind ourselves that most of the pressure we put on ourselves isn't real. Well, thank everyone for talking with us and answering these questions. It was a great discussion. Um, it is now, what time is it? 3.07, so we don't wanna keep people too far over, but thank you again for speaking with us. And this is recorded, so it'll live somewhere so other people can reference it and we'll share it. Um, yeah, and keep doing amazing work. Like we really value all of y'all's work and y'all's perspectives. And whenever we do anything, we're like, who can we pick on? And we are automatically know. <laughs> yep. <laughs> cool, 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 cool. So enjoy the rest of your weekend. It's a Saturday. It's moderately warm outside. So that's a thing. <laughs> All right. Oh. All right. Does someone have, feel free to email us here i'll put my email in the chat if y'all have some questions or anything that we didn't get to mm -hmm. so feel free to email me cool all right y'all gotta Bye. let you go all right see ya see ya it's always just me and you bunny Oh, you're muted. It's okay. Um, I, think, I think I can do it. Can I unmute you? There you go. Oh, there I, you was, go. I was gonna say, <laughs> I was gonna stop the recording too, but yeah, oh, you, okay. did, you did amazing. Oh yeah, I got good. And then I, and I, I really wanted to like, I wanted to be, I wanted to say that, but I also wanted to be like, D I'm not saying that as a surprise. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <no. laughs> Just, I want to be clear. I'm not surprised that you did amazing, but I also wanted to say you did amazing. That was really cool. I really enjoyed that. That was a really great conversation. <laughs> yeah. It turned out good. It turned out really good. They're an amazing group of artists. They are. Who's editing this video. Uh, I might hand it off to Alice. Okay. <laughs> you missed it at the beginning and the end. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, yay. Yay. Yeah. I already went walking this morning, so I don't have to go anywhere. Nice. Hey, yeah. are you, you did such a great job and this, and I didn't say that just to butter you up, but are you, are you around next Saturday? And would you, the, I, I, the, the panel next week is a little more formal than you all did, although I really liked this and now I'm rethinking what I told the others to do, but, um, but would you want to moderate that one at all? Are you free? That one about? Um, funding. So, um, it's, uh, Sergio Rapu, uh, Tahil. Mm -hmm. and uh shireen anukawe and kind of talking about it's it's talking about their projects and things like that too but like um kind of about a little bit more about how they centering a little bit more about funding and like whether they work on their 
own projects or how they work through grants or paid projects or because Sergio has done some different things with um, uh, like the History Channel, I think it is, and a couple of other things like that, like a like put in like I'd like to do this project and then it gets funded and then but then like the constraints of that because it has to still mesh with everything else that the History Channel really wants, you know, mm -hmm. so it's okay. not quite here. Yeah, I can. I can let you know for sure by Monday. Okay. Putting on one more thing to confirm and then I can let you know by Monday. And it's the same time, one to three. Yeah. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. And I would run the tech and stuff like that. So, and I mean, your and nails you, are purple. My nails are purple. <laughs> I, I, yeah, you're, this is the second time in like, <laughs> and it had been like probably, good? I know, I was going to say, it probably would, I do. I just, I really, I, I'm, I'm like, now I'm like debating the whole like should I do what you do with the like the gel stuff that that like that freaks me out but like I hate that it peels so fast and so that's gel it gel it gel it gel it <laughs> <laughs> because that's like I have to say that's like my biggest thing yes I've come accustomed to like I am actually liking them done now but mm -hmm. I don't like that they like start to peel within like three days of you know I'm gonna go either... to the nail salon. <laughs> Either that or I just have to stop doing work, right? That's what my kids are for. <laughs> I'd be yeah. like, hey, yeah. those, dishes. <laughs> those dishes need to be done and I can't do them. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, for real. But oh, yeah, I'll let you know by Monday. Um, oh, there's also take home gel that works pretty good. Oh, yeah, I can maybe give that a try now first, is what you're saying? Coats. Yeah, it's like multiple coats, but as long as you have time to dry them, it's fine. Okay, yeah. cool. Anyway, but I will look okay. at that. <laughs> right. You too. Have a good rest of the weekend. Thanks right. again. Bye. Bye.